a little bit is you kind of ask yourself the question when, whenever you start something new is what's what's the goal, right? What is what is the end point? Or if there isn't an end point, what is the moving goal post? Where do you put it? Um, and with language, I think that's a really difficult thing to do because, you know, you don't have say, oh, I want to play if you're a basketball player, I want to play in the NBA. What's the NBA of language learning? Um, <laughs> and so that is kind of what drew me to the project. But the idea actually came from Zoltan's class because he was teaching about the critical period hypothesis, which mm. is this idea that there is a period um, for every human during which we are naturally capable of learning languages by osmosis. Mm -hmm. um, and after that certain cutoff age, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that and language learning becomes difficult. Um, and there's a lot of different variations of this hypothesis and mm -hmm. a lot of debate over what age it's at or whether it's a strict cutoff or a linear sort of thing. But so he was, and so he was teaching about this and then he said, but some people are able to may be able to actually still learn a language as if they were, or to the point where you wouldn't be able to tell that they weren't a native speaker, um, despite having been after that supposed critical period hypothesis. So we huh. put it at after the age of 18, but usually critical periods usually 18? around like, yeah. So we, we set it at 18, but usually critical periods around like puberty, um, yeah, I was gonna say but it ranges 12, from like eight to 13, yeah. yeah what is the how do you measure depth within a uh, person one of those uh, gifted adults that we you mentioned in the book how do you measure the depth in the language right so that's a good question because how how do you measure proficiency right mm -hmm. and what what does proficiency mean oh because, yes you know we have all these different tests and all these different frameworks to um compare against um and so you know a lot of the times i think here in in europe you have the cefr common european mm -hmm. framework yeah the cefr yeah yeah um yeah and so but for us what mattered was kind of this this phenomenon of passing right because you know someone could have a really really intensely not intensely um someone could have like a very broad understanding and use mm -hmm. of a language um so i think zoltan always used to use himself as an example um because his command of the language arguably is unquestionable right i mean he's written god knows how many books um in you know academic research articles yeah. and everything you know there's not and he lives here he lived here um had his family here and everything so there isn't any situation in which he couldn't um, function without problem right in English but at the same time no one would ever take him as a native speaker um, for various reasons and so then for us it, we're not necessarily saying that being native like is the highest level of proficiency because you could be native like in different domains um mm. Okay. Right. So like some of our participants um, who were native, like in English, may not have had the command of English that Zoltan has, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. But they have achieved this other thing, which is being native, like which is not necessarily achievable for a lot of people. Um, right. Because what... it does have to do with with things like pronunciation. Right. Um, as well as, um, you know collocations or you know different sayings turns of speech um, right even the way that you kind of just gestures and interact with people right i think well i mean there's so much to unpack there right there and i remember i think you you, you guys wrote about that in the book where i think zoltan considered himself a high functioning non-native speaker of english um is that is that a good term that we can use to describe someone as opposed because I feel like and Andrew is probably gonna chime in at some point. I feel like the biggest problem that we have in our in our field now is these this the perhaps the commodification of English language teaching, but much more so this idea of trying to push or sell this non-native like or or native like proficiency because even the term 
sound like a native speaker. You may sound like one, but you're never going to be one. So maybe yeah. you can help us. Well, the other question is, is when you say that you want to sound like a native speaker, yeah. what, which which native speaker, right? Do you exactly. want to sound like, um, I don't a know, Texan. a five-year-old native speaker? Yeah. Do you want to sound like a Texan? Do you want to sound like, I don't know, Boris Johnson or, you know, <laughs> what, what, what is this? Do you want to sound like an academic? Do you want to sound like a rapper? You know what? Um, there's so many different ideas of what what native is, mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, there is this huge, huge problem. I think also because language learners want an idea of okay, I've reached this level now, right? Um, and you know, when we teachers are always given these kinds of frameworks of okay, you have to get your students to this level or to that level, right? And we have tests for these and things, and so then when you have this idea of, you know, a lot of students come in and say, oh, I want to sound like a native speaker. Mm -hmm. And suddenly teachers have to say, okay, well, um, let's, that's, that's problematic for a lot of different reasons. Um, right. What, what do we do with that? Right. And so mm -hmm. I think one thing that was really important for us with this book was sort of starting out at the beginning saying, look, being a native, we're not saying that being a native speaker is the goal for everyone or being mm -hmm. like a native speaker, being native like is the goal mm -hmm. for everyone. Um, and there are a broad variety of different goals for any language learner. You know, you may want to learn, you may want to work in that language. You may want to raise a family in that language. You may want to move, the move to the country that speaks that language, or you may just want to read books for fun. You know, mm -hmm. um, you could have any manner of different goals. And so sounding like a native speaker is a goal, but it mm -hmm. is and should not be the only goal. And it definitely shouldn't be one that is institutionalized because yes. it's so arbitrary, right? Like exactly. what is the native speaker? Who, who, how do we define this? There's so many different gray areas um, mm -hmm. there that it's, it's an, it's a very non-functional target um, for standardization. I feel like, and I don't know if, if you're going to agree with me, um, I feel like because you mentioned this in the book that a lot of language learners, even though they have this very, I mean, myself included, this we all have this initial motivation when we're starting um, some sort of new journey. And in this case, to reach this proficiency, this native-like proficiency. I usually tell my students that like, when you're going to start, when you go to the gym, is your goal to like, I want to have a sick, a very well-defined six pack. How often do people actually achieve that? So I tell them that reaching a native, reaching native like proficiency is, as you said, the NBA of language learning before, I would say that native like proficiency is the sex, the six pack of um, um, gym workout routines, you know? I really like that example a lot. And when you said being native, like in different domains that just, I spent like 10 minutes just throwing that around in my brain. And it's really, really interesting because that NBA example or the six pack, that's not beer. Cause that would be my case. I would, I would definitely get a six pack, but it would necessarily be physical. <laughs> um, <laughs> players or kids, if you ask them who want to be basketball players, you're right. They would probably, Oh, I want to play in the NBA. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's not a finite, as you said, it's not, you know, you have people, you have Michael Jordan and you have LeBron James who are historically, you know, if you could mold in a lab, a basketball player, those are people, those are the two, the gold standards and they are good or they are exceptional at, to use your word at everything, at shooting, at passing, at dribbling, at defense, at rebounding, everything that you would want. But then there are, 99.9 percent .9 of nba players who are not them who are also in the nba mm -hmm. and maybe they excel at shooting and they're terrible at defense or maybe they excel at defense and they're terrible at everything else or maybe they never get to play they're rudy right <laughs> right good point yeah but if you ask them what they do for a living they say i'm in the nba and so in that order to get there they did have to you know be a good player compared exactly. to normal people so is your reflective question of what is the nba of language learning is it can you excel at rebounding and nothing else so can you excel at 
conversation skills and nothing else and be in that native like domain for that one specific thing can you be can you excel at writing work emails because that's the only thing you care about and not excel at other things or is it a bit more complicated than that i think it would be more complicated than excelling at work emails for example because okay. that is giving you you know in order to do that you have to have a good understanding of you know a lot of politeness also very mm -hmm. like locational politeness because mm -hmm. Work emails in the UK are very different than in the US, <laughs> as I have found out. Um, <laughs> so, and then, you know, writing skills and, you know, register and all things like that. So, but on the other hand, I think there are a lot of different skills where you can, you can be really good at um, and kind of let other ones fall behind. So I think one that was more common for our participants was that most of them were much better at speaking because I think our um, criteria on criteria was that you had to be able to pass in a in a conversation so in in a speaking task um okay. that not that we that one but in speaking um so a lot of them actually did cite not necessarily feeling as comfortable in their writing skills mm. um and i think uve for example actually talks about this a lot where he um he actually achieved um spoken native likeness quite early on and he didn't necessarily count this as an achievement because it was something that just happened um, alongside his interest in the sounds of English but then later in his career he actually had to work very hard at his writing proficiency his academic writing and he counts that as that as mm. his achievement because that was uh. something that he actively tried to mold yeah. in a certain way Okay. That's oh wow. 